So uh, I, uh, you know, like I said, I am so happy to be here. I think that, uh, but you know, I'm not here because you know, I have it all together, right? We're all in the same boat. We're all journeying. You guys are here because you have the same desire that I have. We want to serve God. We want to figure out a way to get our family to heaven. Isn't that the main goal? Oh, it breaks my heart to think that I would lose any of my kids. But it's a, it's a faulty process. It's not perfect. We all are struggling along the way. And so the things I want to share with you today are uh, things that are real for me. This is not something that I got three years ago that God showed me, and I'm going to tell you some great words of wisdom. This is me living my faith on a daily basis. This is stuff that the Lord is sharing from, from moment to moment right now in my journey, and uh, I want to share that with you guys. So I want to tell you a little bit about me first. Uh, so she said, I have nine kids. We do. We live in New York, not New York City. It's amazing how many Americans don't understand that New York is a lot more than just a city. <laughs> that actually the vast majority of that state is farmland. And so there's so many similarities here to where we, we live on 70 acres and a farm. We have a donkey and goats and chickens and, and then lots of crazy children. And it's always a mess. The house is always a mess and always loud. But, uh, and I have my nine kids, my oldest is 26, and she is uh, a mom, too. She's married, and she has a little one-year-old, Oliver, the cutest little thing in the world, and uh, so I'm a grandmother, and they live in Dallas, Texas, so they don't live close to us, but then we have five girls and four boys, and, and uh, so besides Oliver, I have another granddaughter, uh, Audrey, who's four, and so my second daughter has a daughter, so... And my youngest is seven. She's a diva. You guys know that word, diva. <laughs> She's a princess, yes. And I always think, you know, so far, some of my, most of my kids, they haven't been perfect. Their journey isn't so messy. And, uh, but we have plenty of time to still ruin that youngest one. And I have a feeling it's going to happen. It's going to happen. So, uh, you know, and I, I see that as much as the effort that we've, we've put into trying to teach our kids the faith and, and journeying with them, and I don't I just try, we, I, we've tried so hard to give them what we have, and it's so imperfect. When our, so let's see, what number is he? He's our second son. He's number five, so he's right there in the middle, Colby, named after St. Maximilian Colby. He is the sweetest. He's 17 now. But when he was young, I remember he came up to me and he said, I don't like Jesus anymore. And I thought, that just kind of cut me to the core. I'm trying to teach you about Jesus. Why don't you like Jesus anymore? And he said, because he doesn't give me a cookie. <laughs> he thinks the man, he, I'm asked, he thought the priest was Jesus and that he was giving everybody cookies and he didn't get one. <sighs> and then I have Jude. Jude is... Gosh, what number is he? He's never he's third boy, so he's way down the line. I can't I can't remember. I, I really have not been able to remember their birthdays, how old they are. But Jude, he is our very type A child. And uh, when he was in first grade, we were in the States, I don't know if you guys how you guys do it here, but they receive first communion in second grade too. So he, he, so he had not gone through first communion training or anything. And we I, we went forward for communion, got back into our seats, and and he's like, I got me one of those. And I was like, what are you talking about? He says, I got me one of those. He must have somehow looked all angelic for the poor deacon who was standing there who didn't know that he wasn't supposed to receive. I said, you need to pray. You, what you got was so special. You need to be praying. He was so angelic the rest of the day, the rest of Mass. So cute. But, you know, you just try and try and try to get them to, uh, to know the faith, you know. And, and uh, it's so... It's just a struggle. So that's my story. That's what I want here. I'm here to tell you today that I am here to share my journey with you. And I, at the end, maybe, if you want to share some of your journey with me, I would love to hear it. If you have questions, I would love to share anything with you, whatever. So uh, that's our night tonight. But first, let's pray, okay? In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Oh, dear Jesus, we thank you so much for... Uh, this evening, this time to be here as women together collectively uh, share in our lives with each other. We thank you for those who are tending the home and tending the children and, 
And uh, we ask that you will give peace to the home so that all of us can go back to our homes and find peace there, not complete chaos. We ask, Jesus, that you will reveal your heart to us tonight. Show us how much you love us. Show us how you desire to join, to walk with us in this journey of motherhood and of womanhood. We thank you, Jesus. We pray for your Holy Spirit to come tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. All right. Now, I'm very type A, and so I have notes. When I, I first started doing speaking with my husband, he is so not type A, and he's all over the place. And so it was so hard to kind of adjust to this idea that he's going to, he's, he goes off on these tangents, and I have no idea where he's going. And so having, having a, a, an outline for me is kind of important. So uh, I, So again, we're here. Why are you here tonight? Why are you here? For wine and cheese? <laughs> yes. Relaxing? Yes. But I do know that your heart is like mine. Like I said, you want to know God. You want to love God. The heart of a mother, the heart of a woman is so tender. It's so, it's so deep. That I, I remember hearing recently that what was the last thing that God created, right? He, the, as, everything that God created grew in complexity. It grew harder, you know, more complex. And the last thing he created was woman, that we are very complex beings. That I always say that a man will never figure us out because we can barely figure ourselves out. And so, but in, in that complexity is such a depth of love, a depth of service, and that we want so much to serve our family and to love, have our family serve God no matter where we are. Like I have children who are older and I, I, parenting doesn't get easier as the children get older. I, I was hoping that was the case, but it doesn't. It gets more difficult. The heartache is harder and stronger. I'm sorry to say that, but uh, I, there's, it's just, it's exhausting when they're young, but it's so heart-wrenching as they get older. And so, uh, so I, for me, I have tried to find ways to measure up. Like, how can, I, how can I model? What can I do to model myself? Now, we became Catholic in Easter of 99. I was raised in a Baptist, a very Protestant background. So I, but I was raised to know God and to love God. And, and uh, so when we became Catholic in 99, it was this great, I felt like we fell into this ocean of opportunity to learn more about God through the sacraments, through the saints, and, it, and it's just was so exciting, to, especially the saints, to kind of figure out all, who all these different saints are and who, uh, all the things that they have to offer us, and, and uh, you guys probably have favorite saints, and so throughout my years of being a mother and, and, and a Catholic, trying to figure out how to model my, what can I, how can I model my motherhood? I, you know, we have Mary, right? We have the Blessed Mother. Very important, very important devotion for us to have. But I always had a hard time. In my very early years of being a Catholic, I had a hard time with Mary because I thought, really? I'm suppo- I, Mary had one child, and he was perfect. <laughs> like, how, how can I relate to that? It's just impossible to relate to that. But, of course, she is. She is, always, of course, our mother, and we're very imperfect. And so we can relate to her and her motherhood. But trying to model my life and my, uh, my experiences, motherhood, after the saints. You guys, St. Catherine, Saint Catherine of Siena. You guys know St. Catherine of Siena. Uh, she has a great quote that says, Be who God made you to be, and you will set the world on fire. Something to that effect. I probably got that wrong. Be who God made you to be, and you will set the world on fire. But it's so tempting to follow, to look at these saints and think that, I'm going to model my motherhood after them. I've done that. I've tried to model my motherhood after them. I, uh, I even went through his phase of wearing, I called them holiness dresses. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and it just wasn't me. I just felt like in the end it wasn't who I was. And, and it was hard to, to try to measure up to the standard that didn't fit well with me. And uh, I, I've, I've known women who have tried to follow a, a daily schedule similar to that of a convent even. And how do you do that? It just takes one kid throwing up in the day and it's all over. That schedule's out the window. And so I just, it was hard, it was frustrating to me. How do I, how do I live this motherhood? How do I teach my children? How do I grow spiritually? 
and I, and I just can't seem to measure up to these, the standard of the saints. And then I have, of course, the competition, I have the, not the competition, even though it does tend to be that way, but the comparison of myself to other moms. We are so good at comparing, aren't we? So good at looking at other women, especially other women, but other families and thinking, gosh, they have it all together. They, they have uh, all the answers. They must be doing something right because their kids actually genuflect towards the front of the altar. So they must have it all together. And uh, but the truth is comparison, I like to say comparison is evil. It is just downright evil. I, uh, why is it evil to me? I think it's because we're doing a disservice to the beautiful, creative work of God. He's so creative. He's so, he has, I mean, goodness, this, this country alone, how beautiful the, the creation here is and how diverse even. And then back in the States, the diversity of the different, you can go just a few hours in an airplane and be in something very different. But our humanity is so diverse. And so to try to be like somebody else is, just, is doing that disservice to God. And then also comparison is evil because it's, it's not a fair comparison. It's never a fair comparison, right? Okay, this is me. I'll sit in church. We're not the quiet family who walks in. No. Like I said, if they genuflect towards the front of the church, but it's a bonus. That's good. And if they're not dipping their pacifiers in the holy water font, okay, we're doing really good. So we make it in, usually late, usually late, and we're sitting there, and we look over, and there's that pew of family. All their kids look clean. They all have matching shoes on, usually, too. And, uh, and you just think, gosh, they fam- that family has it all together. Their kids can even sing Latin. Like, that's, that's, that's so not fair. Mom and dad, they're so in love. Look at them holding hands. They're just so cute. To top it off, she's skinny. Just not fair. Not fair. And to beat ourselves against that door, against that, that standard. I've done that. You guys have done that. I know you've done that. I think all women have done that. We, we measure ourselves against that standard. You know, and sometimes we don't have, sometimes it feels like even church comes against us on that. Like there's experiences that we have, and of course they're not, the church is not intending to be difficult, but there's circumstances that come along that way. For instance, there was a phase where we were doing really good at going to church on a daily basis. Now, I don't know. I have found through my years of being a mom and a Catholic, it's this roller coaster of seasons, right? We're like rocking it for a good six months. We're getting to mass as much as we can possibly get to mass. And we're praying every night more than just a Hail Mary, right? And then it all falls apart. And we can barely, I just want to choke my kids, throw them in bed and say, I'm praying for your soul as I fall asleep. So that's, I mean, so you go through this roller coaster of, of whatever. So we were at a good place. We were going to mass daily. And I was exhausted. Chris travels all the time. So I do this stuff all the time on my own. And so I'm at mass. And my kids, I thought we're doing pretty okay. They weren't that loud. They weren't that bad. It was as soon as we walk out of mass, this old man walks up to me. He goes, will you stop bringing your distractions to church? Now, I pride myself in being able to slice somebody with my tongue. But I was stumped. I could not believe it. I had a lot of things to say to him in my mind afterward. But I couldn't believe it. Will you stop bringing your distractions to church? Guess what I did the next time I went to mass? I sat right in front of him. Yep. And I thought, that's just terrible. And so I, when I've seen this, and other times I'll be at church mass and I'll see, I can see, uh, or there's, I can tell that this woman is feeling attacked by people near her. I will always slip in and try to defend. I had one time, we had a time where this, this uh, choir member came down and attacked all the people in the back who was standing there trying to keep their kids quiet. And I, oh, that didn't do well with me. <laughs> But, uh, you know, so then we have that. And then we have, uh, again, just doing it on our own. So many of us women are doing things on our own. My husband wants to be with us, but at work keeps him from being with us. 
Sometimes, unfortunately, our husbands are not on the same level as us in terms of our spirituality. We, you know, they're on a different, their journey is maybe a little delayed or, or they're a, whatever. There's a lot of things delayed often, right? But uh, they, but whatever it is, that sometimes we're not on the same page. And so we do this on our own. And uh, I've had so many times where I'm in the back and I'm pushing the strollers. I'm pushed back and forth, hoping my older kids are not like, pulling each other's hair and fighting in the pew unattended because I can't be there and I can't and be in the foyer in the back in the back of the church at the same time pacing back and forth trying to keep the baby quiet and then uh and then there was this one time we came in late big surprise and uh but this was and this was a daily mass and it was an evening mass those evening masses are brutal right and to top it off I was pregnant of course that's not surprising I don't know which pregnancy it was. It was definitely one of the later ones because I had so many other kids in tow. But uh, as we walked into Latin Mass late, uh, the gospel reading was going. That's pretty bad. That's really bad when you walk in and the gospel is already being read. So we, we walk in and we're scooting. <laughs> <laughs> But we, we scoot into, everyone's standing, so that was kind of nice because you weren't so noticeable, right? So we scooted into the pew, and uh, we're sitting there. And I, at that point, I was, one, exhausted, pregnant, exhausted, right? And uh, I, it was right around, right before dinner, so all I'm thinking is, what am I going to do for dinner? What am I going to do for dinner? What am I going to do for dinner? And then we're late, and so we walk in, and as, as we get into the pew, I, can ju- I hear the gospel reading, and it was the story of the widow's might. And you guys know that story, right? You have the lady, the Jesus sitting there, and you have the, the one older lady who puts her last coin in the old offering, whatever you want to call it, right? And Jesus pays attention to that and says, because she gave the last that she had, that that meant so much more than those who gave in their excess. And as I heard that, as I walked into, the, into that pew, the Lord, it was like the Lord said to me, Linda, this is your widow's might. This is it. It is completely imperfect it is completely messy but it is your widow's might and he saw that and he he acknowledged that as a good thing that he was okay with my imperfection and then one last story I remember uh going to mass same thing again by myself with my kids exhausted the whole time I'm sitting there trying to keep the kids quiet they're being loud no surprise. And I go forward for communion. On the way to communion, I'm probably making sure somebody's not taking it without permission, right? And I'm making sure everyone's lined up. Fold your arms. Come on, let's get this. You know, don't be pulling someone's hand. Let's go. Let's, let's go forward. And we're walking towards. And so am I, am I in the moment of, I'm going to receive Jesus? <laughs> no. No. There was no connection there. I'm just trying to keep my kids from embarrassing me. And I get up there and I put my hands out and they say, body of Christ. And it was like as clear as day, Jesus says, I'm here. I'm here. Again, in that mess, in that imperfection, he's there, always there. I have a a friend of mine, a good friend of mine. uh, She's had a difficult life, a difficult marriage. She walked so beautifully with the Lord. But she, her, her saying was this. She says that, or this is what she kind of believed, that God brings us beyond our natural abilities. We all have that level where our natural abilities are. He likes to take us beyond that. Like I used to, I have a friend who is, I call her sugar sweet. She talks like this. <laughs> she's so sweet and she's not fake. She totally is that way. And I am, like, nasty and rude. And I think, okay, Jesus, she doesn't get credit for that. Because that's how she is. You made her like that. So she shouldn't get credit for being that nice. Right. That the little bit of nice I have should be way more rewarded than her niceness, right? I'm so, God, I'm so glad he understands me. But uh, I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> but anyway, so that that natural ability, so the, the Lord likes to take us past that natural ability. And 
because it's after that natural ability is where grace kicks in. And in those moments when we feel like that's it, I can't do it again. I can't do anymore. I've done. I've, I feel like I've prayed as much as I can pray. I feel like I've, I've given as much as I can give. I can't do another thing. And that's where grace kicks in. So recognizing where that natural ability is is a good thing. And to allow the Lord to have it at that point. Look at that. I'm doing good. <laughs> Another page. I have a Bible story for you. Believe that. Yep. This has been my Bible story lately. This, every time I, every time I go to the Lord in prayer, I feel like this is the story that keeps coming back to me. This is where I just can't, if I'm reading the scriptures, this is where I sit, is in this Bible verse. And because it just is so where I am, and I know for fact it's where you are, it is Mary and Martha. You guys have heard this story probably more than any, any other story, right? You probably could quote it. But I'm going to actually read it, which I need to take my glasses off in order to do that. Okay, Mary and Martha. I, got, I know you guys know this, but we're going to read it. <clears throat> Now, as they went on on their way, he entered a village, and a woman named Martha received him into her house. And she, she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the, feet, at the Lord's feet and listened to his teachings. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. One thing is needed. Mary has chosen the good portion, which, you sh- which I shall not take away from her. Who likes Martha better than Mary? <laughs> I've always had a problem with Mary. Because <laughs> I am totally Martha. I feel like this is so not fair. Really? Martha is the one working. Mary sitting down. Seriously, Jesus, couldn't you have just told her to help just a little bit? Then they both could sit down, right? But, and so I, and I think that the reason this story, besides the fact that I've always felt sympathy for Martha, but I've also have felt like this story is, doesn't, it doesn't relate to my life. It's unrelatable to me. How many of you have a chance just to sit and sit at someone's feet for the whole day? We're all Martha, We're all working. We're always doing something. And so this was unrelatable to me. How if what Mary is doing is the better thing? How can can I do that? How That is unattainable for me. Unattainable. But there's three points I want to share with this story. Okay? And the first is Martha's misconception. Martha had a misconception. And that misconception was, in the words... Uh, see, she's left me to serve alone. She saw that she was working alone. And the word that I've gotten over and over again is this, is that you are not alone. You feel like you're alone. You're working. You're a Martha Martha. That's kind of like that. <laughs> you guys know the Brady Bunch? I don't know. It might be a totally American kind of reference, right? Mar- what's that? What was that? Martha, Martha. Anyway. Marsha, Marsha. That's what it is. There we go. So, but Martha, all right? So, I, we are Marthas. And so, it to, but I am not, I serve. Oftentimes, I am working, working, because that's my life. That's your life. But the misconception that Martha had was that she was doing it alone. And, you know, what was so encouraging to me with this is that what this said to me was that the work was not the problem. The problem, that, the fact that Martha was working and the, and the fact that I work is not a problem. The problem is when I think I'm doing it by myself. That's the problem. It's all about perspective. I, you know, when my kids were young, bath time is of the devil. That's why my kids were always dirty. It, it is of the devil. Because you're exhausted at the end of the day, and what are you going to do? You have to sit there and just pretend that you really care that they're having a good time in the water. And then you have to clean up afterward because they make a mess of the tub. And so, t- bath time. And I, how many times I sat there just feeling sorry for myself. 
that this is miserable. Or holidays, like Easter, everybody is always pigging out, right? They're eating, they're having a great time, the kids are jacked up on sugar. Who gets to watch the kids while the rest of the family naps? Yeah, I, I, I remember feeling resentful that I'm doing this by myself. And that, you know, the, thing, the truth is, though, is that when we realize that we're not alone, it doesn't change the circumstances, does it? We're still alone. We're still doing it by ourselves. But it changes our perspective. And it, that's what matters, is our perspective. Do we see Jesus in those moments when we are tired, when we're frustrated, when we're alone, when we're working and we feel like we're not being seen or not being helped? Not to have Martha's misconception to think that we're doing that by ourselves. The second point, how am I doing on time? The second point is... I call it Martha's movement. It's her growth. And now, this was what was so awesome. Recently, I was, uh, again, just, I felt like Mary and Martha just kept coming back to me when I, when I would be praying or whatever. And, and uh, I found that they showed up again. Did you guys know that? So when Lazarus, Lazarus died, right? And he was in the grave, and Jesus took his sweet time getting there because he knew he had some great things to do. And when he, he got there, the scripture says that Martha went out to meet him. And Martha said, Lord. Oh, and guess what? Mary stayed home. <laughs> so Martha went out to meet him. And she said, Lord, if you'd been here, Lazarus wouldn't have died. And Jesus said something to the effect, well, he will rise again. And she said, well, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection. And Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And Martha at that point says, you are the Messiah. She made this great proclamation of faith. What a beautiful. So she didn't change who she was. She still went out there. She still was a doer. But, she, but you could see in her a faith that grew. It's a beautiful. I, I just realized that is so awesome that she grew. That she was still herself. Martha was still Martha. So St. Catherine of Siena, be who God made you to be and you'll set the world on fire. Be who you are. To try to be something different is impossible. To find that point where you, you can grow and yet still be you. Isn't that freeing? It's so miserable to try to be somebody else. That your family needs you to be you. Over the last, I don't know, maybe about eight years, I would say, I have been on a journey. I call it my journey of self-discovery. Sounds really nice. But it's been great because I've been, a parent, I've been a mom for over 26 years. And in, so in those 26 years, I think I lovingly gave of myself, sometimes grudgingly, but I found that in the last about eight years, I've been trying to figure out who I am again. And that's great. You know, Chris says to me, he goes, I think the older you get, the grumpier you get. <laughs> and I was like, I don't think so. I think I get stronger. I think I get, I get. <laughs> I get more confident. I know who I am more. And there's such a freedom to that. We don't put up with anything, right? Yeah. Yeah, the older we get, we don't, we just realize what, how less we tolerate things. But it's, it's not that we're grumpy, it's that we're more confident. And so we, that, having that confidence, setting out to find that who you are, that it's so easy to bury that as you're, as you're being a mom, as you're growing, as your family's growing, you're busy just doing everything that you're doing, and for me to have that self-discovery, and what a gift that's been to my kids. Just in a very materialistic, earthly, even non-spiritual way, for me to discover who I am has done so much for who they are. They have grown so much into my older girls. I have th my three oldest girls are women. 
They're full, you know, they're, they're beautiful, strong women who pretty much know who they are. And my third one I worry about. She scares me. I've never lost more sleep with any child than her. And I've told her that. You scare me. But yet she's still a very strong woman. And, and I know that my, the time that I've took to figure out who I am, just in the fact that, oh, I like to bike. Well, that, biking, oh, yeah, I like to bike, has actually paved to be so many great things for our family. But spiritually, that's taken longer. Because I've, I've, I've tried to still figure out, I'm trying to compare myself to this saint, or I'm trying to compare myself to this mom. And so as I get more and more comfortable with who I am, I will stay Martha, and yet I'll still continue to grow. That my strengths, my gifts, and my talents that is revealed to me through the Lord will lead to my calling. Even though Ultimately, my calling is to my family, but also so much more. That we are God's creation, and he has a calling for us outside of even our family, even though the family is definitely the priority there. All right, I'll move on. How am I doing on time? The third point, and I, just, I love this, and this is where I've kind of sat and chewed for quite a while. The third point is that in this story, I've seen that we are called to be Mary while doing Martha. We are called to be Mary while doing Martha. We don't have to give up being Martha. We can't give up. The whole family would collapse if we gave up being Martha. <laughs> but we have, but learning to be Mary. I love this idea of having the heart of Mary in a Martha world. So the truth is I'm a doer. I'm a doer. I love to do, I love to-do lists. I am very guilty that if I, I get up, I have my to-do list during the day, and I am not ashamed to admit that I will write things on that to-do list just for the purpose of marking it off. If I had failed to do that, if I was like, dang, I, I, should, I didn't know I was going to do that today, so let me write it on the to-do list so I can mark it off. I love to-do lists. I love uh, outlines. I love schedules. And, uh, uh, and so, but I'm a doer. I always have a project going. In my family... I'm the one who lays the flooring. I'm the one who builds the walls. I'm always the one doing the projects in the house. He's my muscle, so he can carry. And my boys, you need to carry this wood for me so I can do this. But I'm the one who does things. I'm the doer, doer, doer. My poor kids, can't we just stay home? No, we got, we got to do it. Let's go. Let's go find a place to hike. This place, this country, perfect for that. But, you know, the Lord showed to me, he said to me, he goes, you know, Linda, you're a human being, not a human doer. And the idea of being with Christ, being, being that Mary, sitting with Jesus. But how do we do that and yet live in a Martha world? Okay, the kitchen sink. I have lots of places that I pray. I love nature. I, could, I walk. We have trails on our own property. I love to walk and pray. I have great times with the Lord there. I love adoration. I love being before the Blessed Sacrament. There's something, I mean, obviously, we know why. It's so rich because Jesus is present there. But it's just, it's just transforming. But the kitchen sink, that's where I find I do a lot of therapy and a lot of prayer. Because I'm usually yelling at God there. I don't want to have to go in at the end of the day because all the day's dishes are still sitting there. So I have to clean the dishes before I can do the food, I can cook, because I can't cook in a dirty kitchen. So, but I don't have time to stay in the kitchen all day long and clean it. So I have to clean the kitchen first, then dirty it, and then try to clean it again. And yeah, it's a cycle. It's never ending, like, just like laundry, right? And, and so by the end of the day, it's just like, it's just like bath time. Said the devil. You're tired, you're exhausted, and I get to that kitchen sink to do dishes, and I'm calling out to the Lord. Now, my calling out to the Lord is, oh, Lord, thy God, give me strength. 
my call to the Lord is, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? Why do you expect so much of me? How can I do this? Can't you tell my kids to clean the dishes? But, and so I never, I never think, gosh, why does the Lord want to be with me? Because I'm, I'm not very nice. But the kitchen sink is where I feel the Lord say this to me. He says, Linda, come with me. Come with me. And he doesn't mean go leave the kitchen, which would be great. He wants me to come with him in that moment. Another verse that's been just, oh, it's, it's, my, it's my verse. Do you know when Jesus is walking along the Sea of Galilee, he's walking along and he sees the guys out there in the water. And he goes, hey, come, follow me. What did they do? They followed him. Why? That was my question. Why? Why would they do that? And I'm sure there's lots of reasons why. But in the end, they went because they wanted something of Jesus. They wanted to figure out who this guy is. They wanted a relationship with him. And they had three beautiful years of intimate times with the Lord to learn who he was. Come, follow me. So when when he called to those fishermen, what did they do? They put down their nets and they followed. So when I'm sitting and I'm standing at that kitchen sink and the Lord says to me, Linda, come, follow me. He wants me to put down that burden, put down that resentment, that frustration, that exhaustion. He wants me to put that down and enter into communion with him right there. That's how we become Mary in a Martha world. In those moments, we enter in to communion with Christ. And it's, it's, it's a battle. It's a battle in the mind. Again, it's not like the circumstances changes. It's our perspective that changes. And in that, when the perspective changes, reality can change. Because I'm standing there, no longer am I a frustrated, tired woman. I'm a daughter. I'm a daughter who's entering into a deep communion with the man who loves me, the lover, the lover, the lover of my soul. He sees me to my core and says, you, I love. Do you know that God's love for you is individual? We hear God loves you. And so often, God loves you, God loves the world, God loves you. But do you know he loves you very individually? He sees the very core of your heart, what's there, and loves it, and loves you. And he doesn't want you to stand there in resentment. He doesn't want you to keep striving. He wants wants you to join him. He wants to join you. He's a guy who understands He's the guy who gets it. I don't need to explain why I'm frustrated. I don't need to explain that my hormones are all over the place. He understands. He understands. I remember when I was pregnant, I forget again which pregnancy this was, but I was overdue. I was late with every single one of my, preg- my pregnancies, and so I was about a week late with this baby, and I went to confession, and I sat down in the confessional, and I said, I am so angry at God. I am so mad. I'm so tired of being pregnant. This is just not fair. Why am I still pregnant? And the priest, he just looked at me. He was so loving. He just laughed. And he goes, God made pregnant women. He understands. (laughs) What a comfort. He knows. He sees completely into the core of who you are and loves you. You know, I often have said I want to be a saint. And that's a scary, a scary proposition. I don't want to be a saint because, you know, I want to have an icon hanging in a church somewhere. I want to be a saint because that's what Jesus deserves. That's what he deserves of me, to give my all. But um, I have, I've been under the misconception that these saints became saints because they did it so well. They did everything so well. They were perfect at forgiveness. They were perfect at praying. Perfect at loving people. 
But what I've realized is that actually the saints became saints because they were immersed into the heart of God. And that's their reality of who they were. The reality of how they moved through this life was in complete, perfect communion with Christ. And so, of course, they behaved with doing great things because they were moving within that communion of God. So again, how do we live in this Martha world? How are we merry? And I just have, I have three small little tips of, um, for me, things that help me to kind of do this, help me to continue to practice this idea of being merry in a Martha world. And the one is to actually set time for your own silence. Hard, isn't it? I get up in the morning, the only thing, the only thing that gets me out of bed, I promise you this, is a cup of coffee. That's what gets me out of bed, is the thought of, whew, I get to go have coffee. And so I want that coffee, and I want to sit, and I, I get up early just so that I can have quiet, because I'm telling you, there is no quiet to be found in my house unless I get up early. And so I get up early, and I want to sit, and all I want to do is just sit and quiet. You know, but... The Lord doesn't want me just to sit there and play Angry Birds on my phone. He wants me to enter into communion with him in that time. And so that's a, it's a difficult practice, but it's an important practice to set time aside for, I would say it's contemplation. Sitting and thinking and meditating on who you are and let God speak to you of who you, who you are to him. Because like I said, that, that journey of self-discovery, it's great to figure out who we are. But it's in those moments of contemplation, it's in those moments of prayer is when you are going to fully learn who you are. Because you're going to fully learn who Jesus sees you to be. And so set that time aside, even if it's, it's, even if it's only 10 minutes, and treat it like a conversation, a date. It's a date. You, can't, you need dates with your spouse, you need dates, you know, otherwise it's going to be, you, if you're not talking to your husband, it's not going to be good. And so to have that time with God, even if it's you're tired, but whatever, just, just sit with him. And that's where you're going to find out who you are first. The second thing I would suggest, the tips that I've done, is I like to surround myself with things that, are, that draw my mind upward. Good music. We have good, we have good Christian music on our, in our radio, in our cars, but uh, have it on your phone. So good music. And then the, the, we have religious art. We have crucifixes all over our house. And uh, I remember saying, I remember someone saying that when we became Catholic, that was the holy thing to do. You're supposed to put crucifixes in every room in your house so that you can look at the suffering Christ and gain strength. And I thought, okay. But you know, it really helps. It does help in those times to look at the suffering Christ. But you know, I also realized I want to have a picture of... Um, the road to Emmaus, you guys know that story? The road to Emmaus. It was after the resurrection, and Jesus, the, the disciples are walking in the street, on this road, and, and Jesus is there, and he's, uh, he's just conversing with them. You know, and I said, I said to the, one day I said to the Lord, you know what, Jesus, I love the crucifix. It's beautiful. I understand that. But sometimes I just need an Emmaus Jesus. I need the Jesus who's going to walk with me and just share himself with me. And so those things, those religious arts, pictures of the saints. My girl is St. Therese of Lisieux. She has totally been my girl lately. I just want pictures of her just to remind me of the things that I'm learning, the things that she's teaching me. It helps bring my mind upward. So in those times of frustration, boom, I have something to look at. And then the last tip I have is for you to keep in mind that though this battle of learning to be Mary in a Martha world, it really isn't in the mind. The battle is in the mind, because it's about perspective, right? But just because it's in the mind doesn't mean that it's not a spiritual growth. Sometimes we think that spiritual growth is something that's dependent on those really good God moments. Coming to a beautiful conference, having an amazing retreat, having a great time before the Blessed Sacrament, those great God moments, those, those are your measuring points that I'm growing spiritually. 
But the truth is, it's those little efforts. And, and it, sometimes it feels like, gosh, I must not be working because I'm having to fight so hard to, to switch my perspective of being in communion with Christ. But just because you have to do that doesn't mean that it's not, um, it's not working and that it's not a spiritual growth. Okay, Chris? We're going to pray. Got my man servant here. He has to earn his keep. <laughs> we're going to pray. And what I, want, what I want to do here is we're going to take a moment and we're going we're to practice this idea of contemplation. I want you guys to think about Mary Martha. We're going to close our eyes, and I want you to imagine. So let's go ahead. Let's do that. Let's close our eyes. You know, and it's okay. It's very Ignatian, which I love Ignatius too, to believe that it's okay to engage your imagination. The imagination and your emotions are not bad things. They're part of your human nature, especially as women. God gave those to you. So we are allowed to engage those in our spiritual pursuits. So I want you to engage your imagination. Imagine that you're sitting, you're sitting there with Jesus. You have Mary, your Martha, whoever you are in that scenario. But Jesus is sitting there and he wants to share himself with you. What is it that you are holding on to? Are you Martha? Do you feel tired? Do you feel like you are the one doing it all? What does the Lord want to say to you there? What does he want to say about handing over the work? What does he want to say to you that he is there for you in that time, in that difficulty? Or are you Mary? What a gift. What does the Lord say to you? I want you to, Chris is going to sing, and I want you to just take this few moments and just let the Lord, this is where the Lord is going to speak to you. He has a message for you. He has something to say to you. Because you are so unique and and special to him. And he wants to to be that great lover of that soul, that core of who you are. So come away. To this quiet place, I'll steal the day and I'll look at you and you, you, you can look at me, it will be all right. Come away, oh, come away to this quiet place. I'll steal the day. And I'll look at you and you, you, you can look at me, it will be all right, all right. day and I'll look at you and you 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 can look at me it will be all right all right all right so what do you need from Jesus tonight what do you need for him to do How do you need him to speak to you this evening? Some of you are exhausted and you're frustrated. It's like you've been at the kitchen sink for weeks and weeks. You don't know that there's anything you could say to Jesus that could sound pretty, but he's not looking for a perfect phrase. He just wants to be with you. He just wants to be with you. 
in your mess and your frustration. Just being with you is enough. It's enough for him. Is it enough for you? Is it enough for you to just be with Jesus tonight? So come away. Oh, come away to this quiet place. I'll steal the day and I'll look at you and you, you. You can look at me. It will be all right, all right, all right. Okay, let's just end in a prayer. In the, name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Oh, sweet lover of our souls. Continue to just reveal your heart and your love to us. That we can continue to grow in strength to serve our family, to serve this world, to serve this church. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for your grace. Just ask for your blessing. In the name of the Father, Son, 